In the last few months of 2010, a flood of confidential documents poured into the headquarters of Al Jazeera from a secret source. Soon after, Al Jazeera producer Leila Al Aryan received a phone call. I was basically told by um, some other producers in Al Jazeera's headquarters in Doha, Qatar, that we um, have a big story to work on. So I was brought to Doha without really any information on what I was working on, except that it had to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Upon arrival in Doha, Al Aryan was presented with the largest collection of confidential documents on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict ever to be leaked to the press. The leak of these documents would eventually lead to the resignation of the chief Palestinian negotiator, Saab Arakat. Al Jazeera put Al Aryan in charge of producing the four-part documentary on the nearly 1,700 documents that came to be known as the Palestine Papers. Al Jazeera has obtained more than 1,600 documents that give insight into just how much Palestinian negotiators are willing to give up for a two-state solution. The Palestine Papers are the largest leak of files in the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They're a diary of more than a decade of talks between the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority and the United States. The leak includes minutes of meetings, internal emails, reports and studies, notes, maps and draft agreements. Together they present an unprecedented view into Israeli-Palestinian Authority, U.S., European and Arab relations and reveal a wealth of information about how the parties negotiate behind closed doors. I was given basically hundreds and hundreds of documents and told that these were obtained by Al Jazeera, that they're confidential documents detailing minutes of negotiations, um, maps, everything from emails to PowerPoint presentations. It really you know, runs the gamut as far as what was in the, the documents. Al Jazeera asked Ali Abu Nami, the executive director of the news and analysis site Electronic Intifada, to give his analysis of the Palestine Papers. This was in early January of 2011. I was invited to Doha in Qatar. I later found out that I was one of several journalists and analysts who'd been invited, and it was when I arrived that I was told that Al Jazeera had obtained the Palestine Papers, and it was exciting uh, to have this first look um, at papers that, other than the Al Jazeera editors who'd worked on them, no one had ever seen before outside the people who were involved. So it was a th thrilling experience, and it's an unprecedented look inside uh, the so-called uh, peace process over 10 years. It was pretty extraordinary to read minutes of meetings that really sounded something like an FBI wiretap. I mean, they were very conversational. You really saw what happened behind closed doors, um, what, what it was that they were saying to each other. You saw the dynamic between the Israeli and Palestinian negotiators. A lot of it was very friendly, very you know, chatty, um, very casual, and but you also saw a pretty major imbalance as far as the, the power dynamic. I mean, you had um, the Israelis refusing, you know, one major concession after another offered by the Palestinian negotiators. And you also saw Palestinian negotiators make some pretty unprecedented concessions when it came to major issues from Jerusalem to refugee rights. I, uh, you know, just spent uh, days, uh, actually more than that, uh, two weeks, uh, day after day reading papers, uh, writing about things. Um, it was really uh, incredible. The Al Jazeera editors had done some really uh, hard, mentally backbreaking um, uh, prepar preparatory work in terms of summarizing and looking through some of the themes. But we were given the full database and I went back to the original documents because I wanted to form my own uh, judgment about them and see them in, in their context and their totality. The Palestinians really were, were seen, um, as The Guardian put it, as sort of weak and desperate. And the Guardian was one of our partners, Al Jazeera's partners, in uh, releasing the Palestine papers. And uh, the, the Palestinians were showing their cards very early on in the, in the negotiations, specifically with regard to the Annapolis process. Um, they were making pretty huge concessions without getting much in return. What these papers show is that you can you know, get an, is a Palestinian leadership tailor-made to Israel's specifications, as the Palestinian Authority practically is. These are uh, leaders who have 
very little legitimacy and credibility in the eyes of Palestinians. They have gone along with everything they've been asked by Israel and the United States. And, um, you know, what it shows, they offered Israel to accept a Palestinian state on, um, you know, not even all of the West Bank, to give up all the settlements around Jerusalem, except for um, one major one. Um, and uh, as Saib Arakat, one of the Palestinian negotiators put it, uh, we're creating for you the biggest Yerushalayim in, in history, using the Israeli term for uh, Jerusalem. And all of that, and uh, concessions is essentially conceding the right of return for refugees. And all of that was not enough for Israel. With the creation of Israel in 1948, over half of the Palestinian population became refugees and have never been allowed to return to their homes. Refugees from the 1948 war and their descendants, as well as refugees from the 1967 war, now number over 5 million people. Dr. Salman Abu Sitta, a Palestinian expert on refugee rights and former member of the Palestine National Council, was shocked by how the Palestinian negotiators dealt with the issue of the return of these refugees to their homeland. The pillar of the Palestinian conflict is the expulsion of refugees and the right of return. That issue was rarely brought up except as scarecrow when the Israelis do not want to dismantle some of the settlements, when they want to um, uh, not uh, remove some of the uh, checkpoints or whatever. So they said, all right, if you don't do that, we will demand the right of return. And that's terrible because that is the core, that's the core of the conflict. When it comes to refugees and the right of return, we learned that uh, the Israelis offered a number of 1,000 refugees returning for a period of five years per year, or, so, or a total of 5,000 refugees returning to their homeland out of more than five million refugees uh, scattered around the world. In a private meeting, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas told the Palestinian negotiating team, quote, on numbers of refugees, it is illogical to ask Israel to take five million, or indeed one million. That would mean the end of Israel. Abbas also described Israel's offer of 5,000 over five years as not acceptable. However, three months later, Palestinian chief negotiator Saab Erekat made reference to Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert accepting a proposal of the return of just 10,000 refugees over a period of 10 years. Erekat denies proposing the return of 10,000 refugees, or any specific number for that matter. However, in early 2010, Erekat's office released a paper to the media proposing the return of 150,000 refugees over 10 years, or about 2% of all refugees and their descendants around the world. We also see the Palestinians saying that refugees returning uh, to be settled in a future Palestinian state would depend on annual absorption capacity, meaning even a future state of Palestine would not necessarily have its doors open to all the refugees wishing to return. I am very angry that we are reduced to begging the Israelis for a bit here and a bit there of the West Bank and ignoring the main issue of the refugees and their right of return. When people return, there is no meaning for talking about borders, talking about water, talking about sovereignty. Sovereignty is much less of much less order than the basic inalienable human right of returning home. When people live in their homes, as they do in any other country, then and only then they can select the political structure and uh, the jurisdiction under which they want to live. Um, you also see Israel refusing to accept any responsibility for any of its actions, its historical injustice as far as its role in uh, creating this massive refugee problem, the world's largest refugee population. So um, Israel would continually insist on saying 
that in any final agreement there would have to be an acknowledgement of wrongs on both sides. So, um, of course, it's very important for the Palestinian side to say, uh, to ask of Israel to apologize for its actions in creating this refugee population and in uh, basically ethnically cleansing um, the, the native population upon its creation. This was something that was continually refused by Israel. Control over Jerusalem, known to Israelis as Yerushalayim, and the growing Israeli settlements around Jerusalem, has long been a core issue of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. One of the major revelations brought about by the Palestine Papers centered around this land. We learned for the first time that the Palestinian negotiators had uh, offered to Israel, had presented a map uh, saying that Israel could keep virtually all the settlements in and around Jerusalem. We had not known that before that they had made that concrete offer and they'd made it to Israel and to the Americans. So that, that's new. We saw Palestinians offering Israel to annex all the settlements around in East Jerusalem except for one, Har Homa, uh, which was a pretty major concession and one that has pretty big implications because the Israelis argue when they continue building and expanding on settlements that, you know, these settlements were already conceded to us in negotiations, so what's the big deal anyway? Why is, are the Palestinians saying they'll, they'll refuse to negotiate with us if we expand them? Because we've already taken these. So it explains a lot of what happens, uh, you know, sort of outside of negotiations. And, and over and over again you see Palestinian negotiators off, saying we've offered Israel, the largest Yerushalayim in Jewish history, as far as borders and space, and the Israelis not agreeing to that. And the U.S. role in this is that they, they're basically backing up whatever uh, decision Israel takes and putting pressure on the Palestinians to concede even more. Some of the, the uh, discussions, you know, after President Obama was elected, there were very high expectations that he would uh, take a different role from previous administrations, being much more um, uh, ready to put pressure on Israel, much more ready to be an honest broker. And what we saw from the minutes of the meetings with George Mitchell, very high-level, prestigious envoy, uh, U.S. envoy, uh, was that um, Mitchell, and representing the Obama administration, was acting like Israel's attorney to an extent that, you know, even made the Bush administration look good in, in comparison. So uh, much of the mystique of, or, or let's say the credibility that uh, the Obama administration had and that George Mitchell had as an envoy was based on how tight-lipped he was, that he left everyone guessing as to what his intentions were and uh, who he was going to put pressure on and whether he had something up his sleeve with all this backwards and forwards shuttling. And what the Palestine papers showed us clearly is that, you know, he had nothing. It was a bluff, you know. He was never going to put any pressure on Israel. He was telling the Palestinians, you know, you better go along with this. If you think Obama is going to put pressure on Israel to get what you want, you're completely mis, uh, uh, misreading him. So it exposes, I think, uh, the extent to which there is no American policy. There is no American uh, brokering of the peace process. It's just flat out lawyering for Israel. And it leaves the Palestinians with no choice but to, in the end to say, sorry, you know, you, you've pushed us to, to, to take off everything. We're not also going to take off our underwear for you. But th that's basically what the negotiations, so-called negotiations, became. In other words, it, it shows that there is no Israeli partner and there is no two-state solution. 
And it really blows the cover on the notion that, you know, the outlines are already known and, and you know, they just have to agree on the specifics. Here, these Palestinian leaders offered Israel uh, to keep ev almost everything it's taken up to this point and just leave us the rest. And Israel said no. They weren't even prepared to discuss it. So it blows the cover on the, on the whole notion of or the, all the uh, basic architecture of the, the so-called peace process. And I don't think there's any going back to that same game. It's finished. The Palestine papers have killed it. What the Palestine papers show is that the Israelis were trying to use the peace negotiations as a way to actually get rid of the, of the Palestinians living in Israel, Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, the survivors and descendants of those who stayed on their land in 1948 and today have increased in number to about 1.4 million Palestinian citizens of Israel. One of the extraordinary proposals made by Zippy Livni, who is seen as a partner in negotiations who Palestinians time and again say they trust and like to work with. She uh, offered an extraordinary proposal which basically says that certain uh, Palestinian villages that are sort of on the outskirts of Israel, so they're villages, a majority Palestinian in Israel, that the border of Israel should be redrawn to in fact exclude these villages. They include Barta, Baqa al-Sharqiya, Baqa al-Gharbiya, um, Beit Safafa. And the reason for that is because Livni made it very clear that she wants a divided two-state solution, meaning uh, all Israeli, all Palestinian. And by Israeli, she means all Jewish, no uh, non-Jews living in the state of Israel. So she revealed um, basically her worldview, which is that Israel should be an ethnically pure state and that any two-state solution, any final settlement, should exclude any Palestinians. Now, the Palestinian, Palestinians rejected this idea, but where they were weak was that they were prepared to go along with Israel's self-definition as a Jewish state, which is what opens the door to these kinds of population exchange or ethnic cleansing type policies. So this shows us that I think far from the outcome of a two-state solution being two states living side by side in peace, as the slogan goes, I think it would have opened the door to the next step, which is, you know, after creating a, a sort of a, a Palestinian Bantustan state, the next step would have been ethnically cleansing Palestinians from Israel to that state or to other countries. And so it would have been only an interim step before the next uh, assault, in a sense, on the Palestinians. So that's a very dangerous development. In May, one of the key leakers of the Palestine Papers revealed himself to the world. Ziad Klot, a French citizen of Palestinian origin who served as an advisor to Chief Negotiator Saab Erekat in the Negotiations Support Unit, explained what compelled him to leak the documents, saying, The peace negotiations were a deceptive farce, whereby biased terms were unilaterally imposed by Israel and systematically endorsed by the U.S. and EU capitals. These negotiations excluded, for the most part, the great majority of the Palestinian people, the 7 million Palestinian refugees. My experience over those 11 months spent in Ramallah confirms in fact that the PLO, given its structure, was not in a position to represent all Palestinian rights and interests.
Ziad Klot is not alone in his support for increased representation of the Palestinian diaspora community. Salman Abu Sitta, a former member of the Palestine National Council, believes that the Palestine Papers highlight a lack of legitimacy of those negotiating on behalf of the Palestinian people. They have no authority in the first place to say anything and to do anything without the permission of the Palestinian people. And that permission is not given because 11 million people are not yet represented in the Palestine National Council. This is a problem that I think Palestinians generally recognize that over the past two decades of the peace process, gradually the Palestinian people have been left out. Uh, you know, uh, the, the diaspora, the refugees, they were the first to go. Uh, now, you know, Gaza is sort of uh, cast adrift. And uh, even in the West Bank, it's only a small elite who have any say. And the Palestinian people have been excluded, marginalized, and decisions are being made for them. And the Palestine papers show the extent to which others had um, taken it upon themselves to decide the fate of the Palestinian people and their rights. So there is an, a major problem of representation. Dr. Abu Sitta believes that the solution to this problem lies in reinvigorating the Palestine National Council. Well, um, the Palestine National Council was first established in Jerusalem in 1964 in order to represent all those Palestinians who are either under Israeli occupation or expelled from their home in neighboring Arab countries and abroad in what we call a shatat. All those people are one. They are one Palestinian people and they have their parliament in exile. And so this parliament uh, took decisions on behalf of Palestinian people from 1964 to 1988. After that, there were no elections or near elections, for example, because sometimes it's difficult to do straightforward elections, you do them by consensus and so on. Dr. Abu Sitta believes that the majority of Palestinians want to be represented by the Palestine National Council. The majority of Palestinians who live abroad, like here in the United States or Europe or uh, um, Arab countries around Palestine, they all want elections. Now the people who, on the other side, who's, who prevent that from happening are Mahmoud Abbas and his Palestinian Authority. Uh, in fact, there has been, there has been an agreement uh, among all political factions in 2005 in Cairo to hold elections. And there was a committee created for that purpose, to prepare for that. And Mahmoud Abbas um, um, delayed the activation of that committee uh, on the pretext that it is not the right time or that Arab countries will not agree. But the real reason was pressure from America, Israel, and Mubarak that this will disrupt our activities because the new Palestinian National Council would certainly not concede as much as Abbas and his group would concede, and therefore forming this Palestinian National Council, presenting, representing 11 million people, would obstruct the schemes to liquidate the case of Palestine. However, holding elections in all the countries where Palestinians live also presents major logistical problems. Now, when people say it's common now to hear that um, you know we want to have a Palestinian National Council elected by the whole Palestinian people, well, that's great and I support that. But it's really difficult to conceptualize how this could actually happen in reality. And I'm not saying that to raise obstacles. I'm saying that because I'm for the idea but the, the obstacles are formidable. The Palestinian people are dispersed in many countries. Um, they uh, live under regimes uh, oftentimes that are not willing to allow their own people to have elections, let alone uh, to allow the Palestinians to have elections. Uh, it would depend on a so-called international community dominated by the United States that has been hostile to Palestinians choosing their own leaders. So, 
When we say we want elections for a, pa a Palestine na a National Council, my question is, who's going to do this? Who's going to be responsible? Who's going to make sure the process is, um, is uh, you know, uh, has integrity? Uh, how are people going to be candidates? How, what does it, we're talking about rebuilding from scratch. But Dr. Abu Sitta believes that these elections are essential to moving forward. When there are elections and we have Palestine National Council from which a new cabinet or new executive committee will be selected, then this committee will do negotiations upon the terms and within the mandate given to, given to them by 11 million people. But those people who made these negotiations for 18 years, they were not elected by anybody. However the Palestinian people ultimately respond to the revelations of the Palestine Papers, the leak of this massive trove of classified documents provides an unprecedented insight into what goes on behind closed doors in the peace process. Um, you have a lot of jargon that you kind of have to sift through and figure out what does this word mean or what does that word mean because the people who are practitioners are people who have negotiated for decades and are used to sort of that jargon and for a fresh pair of eyes it might be a little bit confusing but um, so not only are you reading through many many pages but you're also trying to um, discern what's being said and to also find patterns and uh, to, to figure out what the story is and, and you know because obviously with some documents I mean it was very dry language and there wasn't much there so to really pick out the, the golden nuggets if you will. I think that you know, these papers are going to have to be studied by historians. This is a big archive. I think it will eventually change the way we see the peace process, but it will take time for the facts that are re revealed to really penetrate the popular uh, narratives.